Next one, my next family has seen the hot. You don't have no. This one an update concerning Peter Obi court case. Yes, now my obedient family does a hit this like button. They share this video so that may all obedient family may they they are well for it they happen. Share that and comment your opinion after you listening to this analysis. <laughs> Before we see the bias and sometimes outright incorrect statements in the INEC defense, which is a response to P2B and Labour Party's petition, let's give an update on the presidential election petitions tribunal. The question many are asking is when is the hearing going to start? First of all, there is no date for the start of hearing for now. But we are at a stage that we hasten the process. P2B and Labour Party filed their petition, which you are aware, and INEC, APC and Tinubu have filed their own objections and response. Now, Labour Party is countering their responses. When they finish that and submit, the appeal court will set a date for hearing. And when the hearing starts, all parties will base their arguments based on what they have submitted. This kind of makes the process faster. Of course, calling of witnesses will still take time. But, like some legal luminaries have advised, the court should start with the ones that they can decide on quickly. That's talking about the 25% requirement in the FCT. If their decision is in the positive, the losing party can appeal to the Supreme Court which can all be determined under one month. Remember that this decision can't be done in isolation of the other prayers by the petitioners. If, for instance, the court opposes that the fact that the 25% is required in the FCT, that will mean that the declared winner didn't win and it can't fall to Atiku because he too didn't score 25% in Abuja. They will now look at Peter Obi who scored the 25% in FCT, but he still won't be declared winner based on the results that INEC announced because he didn't get the required 25% spread in 24 states. This will now lead the court to determine who actually scored the highest legal votes. If they can't prove this, then there will be a rerun. But if they can prove it, they will declare the winner. This is not even taking into consideration the disqualification of Tinubu that the Labour Party is praying the court. If they disqualify him, it's still the same process. They will still determine the candidate that scored the highest legal votes and the 25% spread. Will the potential lacuna in the presidency influence the judges? Because if they disqualify him or uphold the 25% requirement before the handover date, that means there will be a lacuna in power. The time is very short. They cannot go over all the evidence before the handover date. Will the judges be influenced by the situation? Anyway, let's leave the analysis for another video. Now, let's see the INEX objection and response to the petition of the Labour Party. This entry in paragraph 27, INEX says that, all polling unit results were uploaded by the presiding officers at the polling units to the first respondent e-transmission system immediately at the close of polls and there was no violation of the first respondent's regulations and the Electoral Act 2022. This is blatantly false right now at the point of making this video, not even at the time they filed their objections at the court, the INEC IREV is still showing 94.68% uploaded under the presidential election results. So INEC is misleading the court by making this objection and unless the meaning of all has changed, INEC is effectively saying that what the world saw on election day where the Beavers machine couldn't upload presidential results were all false. This is an arrogant insult on Nigerians. People who failed in their duties are supposed to apologize. Instead, they are claiming that they didn't do anything wrong. The court should ensure that everyone involved in this shameless heist must be held accountable. The second one out of many the legal team is expected to counter in court is this INEX objection to paragraph 4 of P2B's petition. The paragraph reads, P2B's petition was duly sponsored by Labour Party's petition on whose platform P2B contested the election. Labour Party and P2B shall at trial rely on P2B's nomination documents filed with INEC. Look at how INEC responded. We deny paragraph 4 because we put the petitioners to the strictest proof. This is a very biased way of putting it by a supposed impartial arbiter. There's no court judgment against P2B's nomination. In fact, INEC put P2B's name on the ballot because he was sponsored by the Labour Party. So for them to object in this manner, it sounds very much like an opposition party. This is why INEC should be reformed. We will see recommendations in a moment. They can't be wasting taxpayers' money to conduct flawed elections and after, they still waste more money to defend the sham. 
Granted that the APC are saying that P2B didn't spend the minimum 30 days in Labour Party before being nominated, but INEC shouldn't sound like APC except they are making it obvious that they are one and the same. There's also one thing that many people are not paying attention to in Atiku's petition. The states where he's contesting the results seem to be states where APC didn't win. Is he contesting the results of Labour Party and NMPP? While on the other hand, he's telling the tribunal that APC didn't win. Also, cutting P2B and looking to deepen engagement as he calls it. Or is the PDP challenging the votes that APC got in the states where Labour Party won? It's hard to understand their intention. Atiku is contesting votes in Plateau, the entire Southeast, Edo, Lagos, Kanu, and Delta State. Atiku won Katsina and Kaduna, states that APC won in 2019. Kanu, the remaining KKK state, went to Kwankwaso and APC got substantial votes in Kanu, about 500,000 votes. Maybe it is the 500,000 votes Atiku is challenging. Who knows, the legal team and the PDP are not obliged to show their hand before the hearing starts. Labour Party performed according to the voting intention polls by winning the political capital of Nigeria, the FCT, and no other party got 25% there. They also won the economic capital of Nigeria by a large margin. This has been corroborated by the PDP, never mind the INEC declared results, which of course they are challenging in court. The Labour Party also won in Asso Rock. For people pushing the narrative that P2B isn't known in the north, people who live around the Asso Rock bowling unit, are they all from the south? Labour Party also got substantial votes in Adamawa, Atiku's home state. The truth is that Labour Party's performance in the presidential election has demystified the voting bloc of the Northwest Zone. Not that it wasn't known before, but people will always push narratives. Buhari won all these zones, but he couldn't win the presidential election until he won the Southwest in 2015. Some people want to keep pushing the narrative that they hold the key, but it's obvious that they don't. Winning Lagos, Rivers, Delta, Edo, Southeast, and a greater part of the Middle Belt and the Deep South will give a candidate the highest votes in the presidential election, especially when the other candidates are splitting votes in the Northwest and the Northeast geopolitical zone. Not that they didn't know this, they knew. That's why they deployed measures in collaboration with INEC to suppress votes in the South. We will come to that in a moment. This is why we should change the way INEC operates because there's no way to prevent INEC officials from working for the highest bidder. Most of them were appointed by the politicians anyway, so they are beholden to them. If they regain intimidation and voter suppression that happened during the elections are allowed to stand, there will be no need for a politician to campaign or debate in future elections because he can always invest the money into bribing INEC officials to be declared winner. INEC officials participated in the massive voter suppression in the South during the presidential election. You can see the percentages on the map as monitored by Atedo Peterside's team. Yaga Africa also came to the same conclusion. This was the level of readiness of INEC on election day. You can see the South-South and Southeast geopolitical zones were systematically disenfranchised by INEC. In most places, INEC officials didn't arrive until midday to conduct the election. In some places, they came in the afternoon. Many INEC officials also arrived without the result sheets. Imagine, as you can see, this led to voters casting their votes very late in the night. INEC officials didn't bother to show up in many places, so the massive disenfranchisement was planned and executed in these two geopolitical zones to achieve the aim of reducing the votes of one candidate. This did not happen in other zones at the scale it happened in these zones. So INEC intentionally did this to suppress the votes of Labour Party because they know that he is very popular in these zones. Coming back to how we can make INEC to better serve the purpose of which it was created as an unbiased umpire, we need to remove the powers of INEC officials. They shouldn't continue to exercise the power of declaration of results and collation because this is where the manipulation and rigging happens. State resident electoral commissioners and returning officers should just be there for organizing the election and for logistics and bureaucratic purposes. Voting actually happens at the polling units. Why should some people, because of the power they have, declare something different from what came from the polling units? After voting at the polling units, results should be counted and uploaded and a judge will affirm the results. No need for any other person coming in between. The judges will not be appointed beforehand. It is after the voting has concluded that they will take a straw poll to allocate different judges to affirm different results. The work of the judge is not to make a judgment. His job is to look at the constitutional requirement to know if the winning candidate met it and affirm results. Everyone will know who won and who lost before the affirmation. 
All federal constituency elections, senatorial, House of Assembly, governorship and presidential elections should be conducted this way. Major TV stations should also have direct connection to INEX server so as to be able to display the results in real time immediately voting has ended. This will improve transparency in the electoral process because INEC officials can be trusted time and time again they have shown that they are biased. They will rather take bribes from dubious politicians to do their bidding than to uphold the will of voters. We can't be doing the same thing all the time and expect to get different results. Better remove the power from them because change is constant. Also, we need to consider electing our judges and attorneys general. Instead of being appointed by the executive, if they are elected, they won't be beholden to anyone, which will make them to do their jobs without the fear of people who appointed them, transferring them or even terminating their appointment. <laughs> This is the major reason most office holders and government departments are biased and compromised without even hiding it. Look at how fast the police arrest individuals for expressing their right of free speech. Compare that to how slow they are, that's if they ever arrest people who commit grave crimes. The Adamawa resident electoral commissioner, for instance, no one knows where he is today. In fact, the police commissioner who sat beside him while he committed possible treason should have been the one to put him under arrest. But no. He's compromised. He can't do his job without fear or favor. That's the state of the country where chronism and favoritism rules. Even if a police officer was not directly ordered to look away or not do his job, he's afraid of doing his job the way he's supposed to do it. When he sees something wrong being done in broad daylight, because he's afraid of losing his job, he won't get involved. He won't fight the crime. He doesn't know the people in high places that are friends with the people committing the crime. Just like the customs officer who exposed the booming cross-border trade of petrol in Adamawa, this man is a whistleblower. He should have received a promotion for his exposure of economic crimes. But guess what? He was quickly moved to the customs headquarters in Abuja, where he has been in detention since. Who ordered the legal detention of a whistleblower? He did nothing wrong. Just because he mentioned the Comptroller General in his video doesn't mean he should be in detention indefinitely. They can always sue him for slander, which is a civil matter, not criminal. People in authority should not see themselves as demigods. Rather, they should use their authority to better the society and not abuse the powers that they have. The way they treated this customs officer will prevent Nigerians from reporting crimes in the future because the authorities will come after them instead of going after the criminals. It shows that many government departments work for criminal cartels and the highest bidders instead of working in the interest of Nigeria. Thanks for watching. Seven, eight, nine.